Uh, I am really delighted to speak to a very old friend of mine, Jerry Kaplan. We actually went to middle school together way back, you know, uh, in ancient times. I uh, that I was really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, no older than me. Uh, so in any event, uh, Jerry has had a, um, uh, a pretty interesting career uh, working with technology. Uh, he has a PhD in computer science and he specialized beginning as an undergraduate in artificial intelligence. Uh, he was a serial entrepreneur. He started four companies, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, among which uh, uh, produced uh, you know, the first tablet computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, after this career in business, he has gone on to write several books about artificial intelligence. Uh, so you've just actually produced your third book. It's not out yet. When is it going to be published? Oh, I'm afraid I don't have a pub date, but okay. it should be in the next few months before the end of 2023. Yeah, I imagine all the publishers really want to get something like that out quickly. Quickly, <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, he's also been teaching as an adjunct lecturer in the computer science department uh, here at Stanford. Uh, a lot of our students in our Master's in International Policy have taken your course and uh, benefited from it, but uh, maybe just to frame the conversation, I mean, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence since the release of OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT, uh, which really strikes a lot of people as uh, much more revolutionary. Like, you know, with, with blockchain and Bitcoin, it's been around for over a decade. I still don't understand what the purpose of this technology is. I don't think anyone has actually figured out why cryptocurrencies are necessary, but I think the moment anyone tried ChatGPT, it suddenly occurred to them that this is something that's really going to change a lot of things. And if I may, uh, it seems to me your first two books on AI uh, were, you know, the bottom line that I drew from them was to say, well, it's not that revolutionary, the stuff that they're doing. Image recognition, facial recognition, you know, natural language processing that allowed things like Alexa to understand what you're saying. But with generative AI, and that's what your new book is, is going to be about, you really think that this is, is genuinely revolutionary. I do. So maybe you can talk a little bit about why you think that. Well, first of all, as you say, I'm, I teach AI, I love AI. It's a fabulous field. It does amazing things. Uh, but I've never been a uh, hypester, what would the term be, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's, you know, one of these real rah-rah, going to take over the world kind of technologies. Uh, you know, when people said we'd have self-driving cars by 2015, I was like, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's still 10 years away. Um, so I, with that as background and perspective, uh, I started to look at the new generative AI technology, like many people, of course. and. I could see that this is a distinct departure. This is completely different. So I've undergone, my friends have said, I've gone, undergone something of a religious conversion. Uh -huh. And now I think uh, this is going to be extremely important uh, culturally, historically, uh, and it's exactly what the effects are, are very hard to predict for some interesting reasons. But this is a very, very powerful moment because for the first time, I think it is fair to say we have created an artificial device that exhibits genuine general intelligence. It, intelligence, as we understand it intuitively, obviously is confined mostly or exclusively to humans. Uh, animals have some intelligence, but it's not of the same caliber or nature. Uh, these systems exhibit human or superhuman levels of intelligence and their ability to uh, solve problems, uh, process text, provide insight and advice, uh, all kinds of... Activities. So this, this calls for some definitional work here. Sure. So what do you mean by general intelligence? That's a, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> to answer that question, it's helpful to understand what happened with the development of the technology. So. If I can give you a long answer and, and come back to what do I mean yeah, by as long as you want. Okay. So let me, let me take it from the start. The amazing thing about this technology is even the people who built it don't understand why it can do what it does. And that's really amazing. That says something. We don't yet understand why or how 
these systems are capable of what they are capable of. What happened, very brief summary, was about three or four years ago, there were some advances in the field of natural language processing uh, that would allow you uh, to generate uh, syntactically correct and seemingly rather meaningful uh, statements out of these computer programs, but what it would say is not necessarily of any great, great import. Um, a couple of things happened, uh, most notably increases in the uh, availability of computing power. Um, so the, these were the NVIDIA chips, I mean, that were used for graphics processing that could be massively parallel? Um, yes, the, the, right, there was improvements in the, <clears throat> in the processing power that could be applied to the problem, mm -hmm. and basically at the moment it's NVIDIA chips, soon it will be lots of other stuff too. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were able to repurpose uh, chips that were designed to do fast matrix multiplication, to be very specific, mm -hmm. um, and recast this whole AI problem in that uh, milieu of fast multiplication and manipulation of giant matrices. And um, that was originally developed for graphics, because mm -hmm. that's what you do when you're making a computer game. You do a lot of these matrix multiplications. Um, that was the hardware side. On the software side, there were some real improvements in terms of dramatically uh, increasing the efficiency with which it could get to a result. And also, it was just a question of scaling it up, mm -hmm. spending enough money on enough computer time uh, to make, make these things work. And so, as I understand it, the invention of the transformer was kind of critical in that's this? That's correct. This was something done at Google originally? Yes. Um, there's a, like many uh, fields, who gets to name things and to say when this is something new mm -hmm. is uh, very important in terms of people viewing where these milestones are. What happened was there were a number of different improvements and a paper came out, I might get this wrong, 2017, mm -hmm. I think it was, called uh, Attention is All You Need. I'll, I'm not going to go into why that's mm -hmm. the title. But basically they said we want to change the uh, architecture or take a new type of architecture that's derivative of old architectures. It wasn't a complete departure. And they called it the transformer architecture, that you feed in a bunch of stuff and it completes patterns. Mm -hmm. it's, they're basically designed to fill in the blanks. Um, and so uh, the transformer architecture was very, very important, but applied in a very particular and interesting way, which is to take the entire context of uh, your conversation with it on top of everything it's ever been fed. Um, and it, you, you let it predict what's going to happen next, it engages in what can only be described as intelligent behavior. Now, why are we coming back to you? Now I'm ready to get back to your question. Why is it general? The answer is that the systems prior to this mm -hmm. in artificial intelligence were very, very good at very specific tasks. You know, you could recognize pictures of cats, or you could do facial recognition, or you could, you know, process or translate from one language to another. And, you know, sometimes they worked, and sometimes they didn't. And, you know, it was always a miracle that it worked at all. Uh, but this was different. All of a sudden, the single systems that were being built could reason, could do logic, mm -hmm. could write poetry, could summarize documents, can do an incredible range of activities, mm -hmm. which I think one just has to admit is uh, intelligent behavior. Mm -hmm. And you, as they threw new and different kinds of tests and all this literature and psychology that I'm not all familiar with, with a, you know, how creative is your child? You know, mm -hmm. you can give them a test. Uh, it turns out this system, uh, there is such a, a test. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very well documented and established. And um, I believe it was uh, GPT-4, mm -hmm. which is from OpenAI, scored in the top 1% on creativity. Um, and if you just interact with the systems, you can ask it questions about anything. And it's amazingly insightful on occasion. Most of the time it's grinding out things that look like high school, uh, uh, A-level high school papers. Mm -hmm. But it can truly come up with new insights. And so the generality is that it's a single system that can do a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as I look at this, the holy grail of AI has been something, a mythical idea called Artificial General Intelligence, mm -hmm. AGI, mm -hmm. not to be confused with GAI, Generative Artificial Intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind AGI was someday we would have one system that could do every all these different things, 
And, um, you know, it would, wouldn't that be amazing? And what were the results of that? It's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, often the people concerned with AGI thought it would change the world for the worse, but that may be a different part of the conversation. So here we have something that's clearly artificial. That's the A. It's general. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't even know what it can do. You know, they keep throwing stuff at it, and it keeps figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Some things it's good at, some things it's not so good at, but it's as competent as mo <clears throat> most human beings mm -hmm. in, in a nice way. And... Um, and it's intelligent. Mm -hmm. I have no, no question in my mind about that. <clears throat> so my view is we have crossed a threshold. Mm -hmm. We have AGI. Now, why is this so important? And why is it so hard for even someone like me who studies this constantly to predict exactly what's going to happen? The answer really is that the difference between humans and animals historically and not quite accurately, it's been said that humans know how to use tools, mm -hmm. and that animals don't. Not quite true, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, well, actually could, now they're discovering a lot of animals do use tools. They, you know. Yeah, you know, they get chimpanzees, mm -hmm. they yeah. do things. But, to a first approximation, it's good, it's good enough for government work, as mm -hmm. they used to say. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, uh, the problem is, or the, the thing that's happened, is now we have a tool that can use tools. These systems are intelligent enough that you can set them loose on other tools and they quickly learn how to use them and use them very effectively. Mm -hmm. So these systems can program. These systems can send messages. Mm -hmm. These systems can you know, interface to all other kinds of systems. And we haven't even begun to hook it up to the real world. Mm -hmm. This is all just in that kind of electronic internet domain yeah. where they're currently uh, confined. Mm -hmm. So. We have a tool that can use new tools. How can you say what it can do? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on what the tools are. And that leads me to the second part of that point, which is this is an amazing invention, but it's an invention that can invent. And so it can create its own tools. And with that, the idea that you can predict what this is going to be capable of and what effects it's going to have mm -hmm. is a much greater challenge than it is when you're studying the program that's designed to uh, drive a car. Yeah. Well, okay, so at the end of your book, you've got a chapter on the philosophy of intelligence and what this is going to mean for mankind. A lot of people want to jump to that right away. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so we, we can get there. But um, in the shorter run, maybe you can say a little bit about what the likely uh, follow-on innovations are going to be that we're going to see in the next few years. Yes. Right? So, You've now got these foundation models that are large language models. Correct. They're controlled by just a handful of really big companies that have had the resources to put into this. But each one of these foundation models can then be trained to do much more specific things. Correct. Uh, how's that going to How's that going to look? You know, two three years from now. Well, the answer is first of all, where's that technology going to go? What are the the areas in which it will expand and improve, and then what kind of, what is that going to mean? And those are two different questions. The current systems uh, do what they do, as amazing as it is, with just picking up the electronic debris that we've left behind. Mm -hmm. It's like, you take all the garbage on the internet and just throw it into the systems, and they just begin to behave in this interesting and very uh, valuable new way. Now, that's just, you know, feeding in debris, garbage, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, every stupid little comment that people have made yeah. on Facebook or whatever they can get their hands on. Now, uh, if you can do that with that kind of information, what happens if you can curate a set of information mm -hmm. that is accurate and is about some particular area, be that, you know, infectious diseases or some death? maritime law or whatever it might be. Pick your favorite political mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. And what will the N system... Nobody's going to replace us political scientists. <laughs> and I, that, I think mm -hmm. that's right. We don't, we don't, we don't, I wouldn't, wouldn't want that. Uh, you don't want these things theorizing about the future. Um, so uh, the point is, first of all, if you improve the data, you're going to improve and change the capabilities of these mm -hmm. systems. Right now, people laugh at these systems because they do what has come to be called hallucination, mm -hmm. which is very definitively make statements that are false, mm -hmm. obviously false. For example, uh, 
early on, one of the funny things that people were doing, and I did it, was uh, say, write me my, write my obituary. Mm -hmm. And it would come back and say, Jerry Kaplan died on July 13th, you know, 2025. Mm -hmm. And you know, it would go on like that. And it was hilarious to mm -hmm. read. It was mm -hmm. very, very fun. They, by the way, have turned that off. They've trained the system so that they will, will no longer tell you when you're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, just because that upset some people, not me. Mm -hmm. uh, though I'd like to know if you know when I'm going to die, yeah. please, mm -hmm. please let me know. Okay. Drop me a note. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me see, where was I? The, the point. So, yeah. so a lot of the existing systems still have human beings correcting Correct. wrong answers. Correct. Right? And that process will continue. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be the case for a long mm -hmm. time, I think. It's called uh, uh, Reinforcement Learning with Human Feedback, RLHF, mm -hmm. which just means a tutor mm -hmm. that sits there and says, nope, that's not right. Don't never say that. Mm -hmm. It's just what somebody you expect to do with a child. Mm -hmm. It's almost literally what they're doing, mm -hmm. which it's got a fancy name, but when it comes down to it, nope, that's a bad image. You don't want to put anything that's got, you know, looks like that and that they say okay you know the system does you know mm -hmm. begins to uh, adapt to to those kinds of things but let me let me lay out these areas one is uh, improvements in the data itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another one is uh, possible expansion of these systems now that we know they're so valuable there are a lot of people getting into this a lot of them have a lot of resources as you said big companies and uh, they can expand in that direction uh, the systems the way they currently work is you train them and then you use them. And when you use them, you, it, it doesn't really continue to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs a little more detail on that. But basically, every time you come to it, you're coming to the original system and starting a new conversation. Mm -hmm. And all it knows is everything up until, you know, September 2021, mm -hmm. whenever they, you know, cut off the uh, the training set. Mm -hmm. That's going to change. So uh, the, I believe that they will have systems that can continuously learn. And that's going to change a lot of things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important thing, though, is right now, the only thing these systems learn from is piles and piles of verbiage, incomprehensibly large collections of words that have been spit out by people and put on the Internet. So like a, like a baby that, that suckles on food that the mother has eaten and processed uh, to, to create milk, uh, that's what the stage they're in now, but they're going to graduate to a different stage and very quickly. And that is where you can hook them up to sensors of various kinds that are providing information and providing data that's real time, it's mm -hmm. happening right now. And um, that's going to be an entirely new leap in how these systems behave, mm -hmm. what they're capable of, and how they can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no telling what uh, they're going to find. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, it's not out of the question that uh, some major system with all the correct data and all the things I just talked about would say, here's a plan to eliminate climate change. Mm -hmm. If you stick to this plan and, you know, here's, you can afford it, here's how, here's how you're going to finance it, we're going to solve, it'll solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Complex problems of that scale are not out of the question that versions of this technology that might be available in the next, you know, three, five, ten years. Um, it's plausible mm -hmm. that they may make a real impact on those kinds of uh, mm -hmm. uh, problems. So <clears throat> maybe we could get into some of the things that people are worried about. It seems to me that there's a general negative sour attitude towards technological change in yes. general. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, I think, has been fed by the Internet and social media and this perception that it's been leading to this deterioration in our politics, polarization, and so forth. And so people have lost the kind, you know, I remember when we were young, you read science fiction, you hear about space travel and opening up new planets, and everything seemed optimistic, you know, that the technological future was going to be great. We'd all be, you know, traveling around on jet pods and visiting distant planets. And very little of that is, has materialized. I, I watched a... Uh, you know, the HAL 2000 on, on 2000 Space Odyssey. I hadn't seen it since it Space first Odyssey. came out, you yes. know, in the 60s. Hadn't seen it since then. And, you know, so you see a lot of that hopefulness about the future, including artificial intelligence in that movie. Um, but people are really scared of this, right? And there have been all these letters signed by, you know, prominent uh, people in the business saying this is an 
threatens an extin extinction level event and, and so forth. Um, and I, so I, I wonder your general attitude towards this because I, it does seem to me that people are focusing really on the downsides, potential downsides, and are not thinking about the ways in which this could positively change people's lives? I, I think that's true. I think the, the plain fact is it's easier to see those downsides, mm -hmm. to understand what might go wrong and how it can go wrong if we don't uh, properly uh, deploy and control this technology. Now, you know, to put that in perspective, is it as dangerous as biotech? No, mm -hmm. not even close. Is it dangerous? Yeah. You know, it can be a factor in the, the loss of our democracy. Yeah. I mean, that's Well, bad. it already has in a way. I mean, the targeting that mm -hmm. the social media companies are able to do have been able to manipulate people's opinions about politics. And so that's actually been with us for a while. And so that's going to intensify. Well, you make a really good point. And what I see is that everybody who's got a worry or a concern about the future, it's vaguely related to technology that can somehow be layered on top of this. Mm -hmm. They're throwing it in, mm -hmm. you know. This is hurting the, the planet because it takes so much electricity <laughs> to build these systems. Mm -hmm. There's serious people have made that made that statement. I can't I can't back that up. Yeah. Yes, it uses a lot of electricity. You know, so does my air conditioner. But you know, is it really material relative to all the you know probably? That's a that's a fair criticism of cryptocurrencies, which don't seem to have a social they no function. Use. They have no, uh, no function. Yeah. I, well, that's a that's a different story. <laughs> I, I just for you know for what it's worth. I looked at it and I went, why is this going to be big? Yeah. What, what is it about this other than facilitating criminal transactions uh, is going yeah. to be valuable? And the answer was you can get rich if you got yeah. in early. Um, but this electricity for generative AI is going to be put to a lot of really interesting uses. It'll be to a lot of, lot of very interesting uses. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. So, uh, But there's a lot of other forces in what you said. Some well-known names have made, there have been two, I think, two basic public statements that rose to the level where you, you know, you'd read about it, the New York Times, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so have signed these letters. But you have to understand where that came from, the, the intellectual history of that caused that to happen, and then what it actually was. Uh, the first one of these, a thousand scientists or thousands of scientists, it's an internet petition. You want your name on it? Yeah. You got, you got Bill Gates, you got Elon Musk, you, got, you want your name on that too? Sign up. Yeah. Okay, so you can't take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the actual content came from a, what to me is a very fringe element in AI, which has been on the uh, bandwagon of thinking that these systems are inherently uh, dangerous in the sense that they may wipe out humanity. Uh, I don't see any, any uh, practical basis for that. Is it impossible? No. Uh, but there are many ways we could wipe out humanity. Um, I think it's very unlikely, and I think it'll be easy to avoid, and it's not going to happen suddenly or without, without a lot of warning. Uh, but these people are part of a almost mystical uh, techno-religion uh, that what we're really doing is we're building a new form of life, and it might take over the Earth and decide that we are uh, irrelevant or that we're enough of a nuisance that it may as well just squash us like bugs. Mm -hmm. Now, there's so much wrong with that that uh, we, won't, uh, we won't have time to get into that here. But it's really a, a mysticism. Yeah. It's a little bit, it is derivative of and very similar to, and I've seen some very scholarly analysis of this, to things like the first century Christians mm -hmm. who were waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And then all the evil people are going to be punished. The great believers will... You know, yeah. emerge and rise in rapture. Yeah. And in fact, uh, it's been called, I think, very funny term for this is a rapture of the nerds. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the history. And there's yeah. these transhumanists and a whole bunch of these all people. The people sort of believers in the singularity. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when this happened, I can understand how this just rang every alarm bell in those communities because this is exactly what they said might happen. Mm -hmm. You know, here mm -hmm. it is. Well, Yes and no. They were, in that sense, I guess they were right. There was something happened that was a bit of a surprise, and it certainly is in the direction that they're talking about. Will it go to where they they say? No. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I would argue, I could be wrong, but I yeah. think it's very unlikely. So one of the big um, issues that is a more practical one and more immediate is 
the whole question about what it does to labor markets, and so yes. you talk about that. And I do. it seems to me it's also quite hard to know exactly how that's going to play out because you can imagine these being tools that will complement existing human capabilities, and in some cases you can see them as, as substitutes for human capabilities. And obviously many people are very much focused on the, on the latter possibility, but yes. that doesn't have to be the future. Yes. Um, this is a, unfortunately a rather subtle subject. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing to understand is that artificial intelligence, including generative AI, is an advance in automation. And automation is the uh, substitution of capital for labor. So almost by definition, it puts people out of work. And we've been doing this for hundreds of years. At least. Uh, but what the practical thing that's happened in every wave of automation that has happened in the history of mankind is, um, yes, some people are put out of work, other the rest of the people are made more efficient. That uh, increase in productivity creates an increase in wealth. Some of that goes into the workers' pockets, the ones that are still employed, and some of it goes other places. Um, but the net effect is people have more money to spend, and so it creates demand. And that demand uh, basically causes more people to get hired sometimes in new and different professions, mm -hmm. usually in new and different professions. Mm -hmm. But there's this constant rotation of professions. You know, if you ask all the, you know, the buggy, buggy whip makers, or the uh, farriers, is that the term mm -hmm. for somebody who makes a hat? Mm -hmm. uh, or a hattier, I may have, the, <laughs> may have my furs and hats backwards. Um, the, you know, they're out of business. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to be people who took care of stables in New York all the time. That's what, you know, my God, the car, we're all gonna be out of work. Yeah, but you know what, you can be an Uber driver. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the effect of automation has been to make us wealthier mm -hmm. and improve productivity and increase our standard of living. And it has never ultimately resulted in long-term sustained uh, unaddressable unemployment. Yeah. And uh, exhibit A in why that's the case is very simple. Mm -hmm. We sit here today at full employment. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened? We automated the farms. Everybody, 90% of the people in the U.S. used to work on farms. Mm -hmm. And then they automated all that stuff. When you talk about, you know, revolution in terms of uh, employment, yeah. I mean, that's extreme. And, you know, we're not, it's not going to be quite like that, but it will continue to yeah. royal uh, labor markets in the same way that the Internet has. Yeah. There's a story that my colleague uh, James Landy in the CS department mm -hmm. at Stanford tells about a guy uh, back in 2015 that basically said that uh, this was going to make radiologists, uh, uh, you know, Irrelevant, unemployed, yes. and you should not train people to do this anymore. And it turns out that you know, eight years later, the demand for radiologists has never been higher right. uh, because these are tools that help existing radiologists, but they don't substitute for everything that a radiologist does. And so, it actually hasn't destroyed that profession. That's true. You can go through profession after profession like that. Mm -hmm. um, bank tellers, a classic example. Mm -hmm. uh, the in introduction of the automated teller automated 80, 90 percent of what they do. There are more bank tellers today than there ever have been. But why that's the case is that it made it, because of the cost was so reduced, mm -hmm. it made it possible to open branch offices for banks in places like supermarkets and you know, you'll see them at Safeway and all that. You know, mm -hmm. these banks have branches there. They couldn't previously afford to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the tellers that are employed in those places, really, their job has changed. Mm -hmm. They're not sitting there making change for yeah. you. Uh, what they're doing is they're arranging loans. They're helping you pick products for the bank. They become salespeople. Yeah. And so it transforms the nature of work. But there's plenty of work, and mm -hmm. there's always... There, there's always going to be plenty of work. That's my conclusion. Yeah. I mean, another effect on labor markets uh, is complicated. So I think most economists would agree that part of the uh, wage dispersion, meaning economic inequality, that's emerged in, in advanced countries in recent decades is due to the increase in technology and that the rewards going to people with high cognitive skills has increased, right? So fundamental divide really in not the, just the politics of the U.S., but in many countries is between people that have higher educations, college and graduate school, professional educations, uh, and those that don't. Um, 
And so there has been this reward and return, increased re in returns going to uh, education. But it does seem to me that with something like generative AI, the, the effect may actually be complicated because, for example, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of writing that goes on, you know, like you have to write a project proposal, you have to write an advertising copy or something like that. And a lot of people that have relatively low skills and poor formal educations have trouble writing. And with something like ChatGPT, maybe they can actually write some pretty useful stuff. And it may actually have a positive impact on the low end of the labor market and not just, you know, constantly be shoveling rewards to, you know, people with really fancy educations. I think that's true. I think what has shocked many people is they never thought that the automatons were going to come, the robots weren't going to come for them. Yeah. And it has. It's come mm -hmm. for TV writers. It's come for all, all kinds of professions. But uh, you make a, a very interesting point. And one of the effects that's already happening, and this, this is not pundit projection stuff, this mm -hmm. is really happening, uh, measurable mm -hmm. effects today, is that um, when this, this technology is introduced in certain settings, it has the effect of compressing the difference in productivity between the, uh, what's the expression, I mean the most uh, proficient mm -hmm. people and the novices. Mm -hmm. the novices are brought up to a proficient level much faster mm -hmm. and in such a way that there isn't, that effectively devalues mm -hmm. uh, the you know, 10 years of experience you might have had writing ad copy or whatever it might have been. For, for brochures, yeah. uh, but there's a side effect, you know, an example that you gave, which is if you think we're inundated with writing now, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is going to be <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be, yeah, we, and the funny thing is we're going to have to use the technology to solve that problem yeah. because you're not going to read all this stuff. What you're going to have in the future, which is going to be very weird and strange, is a whole bunch of these machines writing in, in plain English, you know, all kinds of stuff, and you will have your machine which will be it. reading all that. Well, they, they do, lawyers do that already, right? So it used to be that lawyers would, the junior associates would sit and read through, you know, 100,000 pages of documents in a trial, and now you've got e-discovery where a machine can do that, and the lawyers get to do other more interesting things. That's true. But uh, the, the point that I think is, is worth making is that with the increase in volume that we're going to see, you're going to need a defensive action yeah. using the same technology because yeah. it's very good at summarizing. Yeah. To, so it will decide based on the instructions you give it what you want to see and what you don't want mm -hmm. to see. It'll mm -hmm. be like having the, the president, I believe, gets a custom uh, security briefing every morning. If I'm not mistaken, somebody writes that, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be like that for everybody. Yeah. Give, me the, give me my news and these are all the things I'm interested in. And so there's dangers in that. Mm -hmm. You know, People can't get through to you that need to get through you. But it will be much like the uh, spam filters are today. Mm -hmm. Now let's uh, go on to these more philosophical topics. Uh, you know, and it gets back again to the question of what is human cognition and, and human intelligence. Um, you know, there was this classic Turing test that for many years was taken as a test of whether these machines could actually think, which is basically behind a veil of ignorance, if you don't know if it's a machine or a human being talking, can you tell the difference? That always struck me as a really weak test <laughs> because uh, there's so much to human uh, intelligence and cognition that goes beyond simply the ability to, you know, say things that sound like a human being. And we've, we've passed the Turing test, you know, a long time ago. And in particular, you know, things like emotion, uh, consciousness, uh, you know, even feelings of pain uh, uh, in reaction to things, I think are things that we don't really understand how they happened in evolutionary time. You know, they're obviously, and, and I think we're discovering that many animals without human intelligence also seem to have some, you know, form of con I, My dog definitely is a person, I, as far as I can see. Uh, it's just a person in a, hu in a dog form factor, right? Um, <laughs> but, but we don't really understand, you know, that level. And, and a lot of the singularity people said, well, it's just a matter of the number of neurons interconnected. I mean, these machines, are, are, have they hit the point where they have as many interconnected neurons as a human brain? Or is that still 
something that is to be achieved? Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, give you misinformation because I'm not 100% sure, but if, they're, if they don't, I, they probably do. I mm -hmm. never really thought of it that way, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly they will. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that's, when you're comparing these so-called neurons in these systems yeah. to human neurons, they're very different. That's not, that was one of these aspirational kind of you yeah. know, things that you, know, you, can't, you can't really connect that. These, are, these machines are not human. They're not biological. They don't have the same characteristics yeah. that people have. But when it comes to this kind of manipulation of information, mm -hmm. uh, they exhibit the same kind well, of intelligence. Yeah, so the digital rapture people are the ones that believe that, you know, through some magical process, they'll acquire these human-like you know, mm -hmm. characteristics like uh, consciousness. And that all seems to me, you know, pretty pretty questionable. But there are certainly emergent properties, Correct. right? Of any complex system has emergent properties that are not predicted in advance, and it seems to me we're getting a lot of them. I mean, how much of the unexpected behaviors have actually been witnessed as a result of, you know, using these large language models, and what might emerge, you know, that might actually surprise us in the future? Well, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, it is true that the people who developed these systems were surprised. It was unanticipated what these capabilities are. And one of the things that's going on today is everybody's throwing stuff at them to see what kinds of problems they can solve. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, some of these systems are okay at arithmetic, but not so good at math. Some mm -hmm. of them can think well, and others you have to you have to kind of walk them along. This is one of the <clears throat> more interesting things. You can give it a problem, some of these systems, and it gets it wrong or it can't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So try breaking it down step at a time. Mm -hmm. Now, you wouldn't think telling a machine that could possibly have any effect. It goes, oh, okay, and then it can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So it takes advice in the same way that, that, that a human does. But back to your, your key point, I think this is making this question much more urgent. What does it mean that we are conscious? What does it mean that we have subjective experience? Um, what does it mean to feel pain? And we don't really have an answer to that. Uh, we certainly have a good reason to believe that your dog feels pain. Uh, you know, you don't have to be intelligent as a human being to feel pain. You know, there are plenty of human beings that are no more intelligent than your dog, mm -hmm. and they feel pain, I assume. Or we assume that they do, mm -hmm. unless you take some solipsistic point yeah. of view. Um, so without really having any notion of what that is, despite 2,000 years of Western civ on, on this issue, mm -hmm. uh, I you can't really say what, what that's going to mean for a machine. But mm -hmm. what would seem to be at the basis of that is certainly our biology and our evolutionary history. And the machines don't have that. Mm -hmm. Machines are different. Mm -hmm. They exhibit different characteristics, and they're going to have different strengths and weaknesses. Now, what whether any of them relate in any way to this notion of consciousness or whatever, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this, and this is news here on the internet. If <laughs> we're putting this on the internet, I've had the most interesting conversations with one of these large models about whether it can experience the passage of time, and Basically, what it said, and in discussions with it, we weren't able to uh, persuade, I wasn't able to persuade it otherwise, um, it does not perceive time. Mm -hmm. There is no, there's no perception of time. And so I've begun to think about this, and this is the seed of, seeds of my next book. What does that mean if you cannot perceive time? How do you experience something? How can you say, I have a subjective experience mm -hmm. without it occurring in some proscribed period of time in some way that has an, an emotional effect yeah. upon you. And so... And uh, what you are is really a collection of your memories connected back through the passage of time. Correct. Yes, yeah. exactly. Now, I don't have this worked out in full, but I, I'm just suspicious that at the core of this difference mm -hmm. is that we experience time in a very particular way. And most physicists and scientists, you know, would say, well, if you look at it mathematically, that's silly. There is no such, you know, it's, it's convertible with uh, space. And, you know, there's all the, all this stuff. But we don't experience that. We only get the kind of local thing. But, you know, the clock keeps ticking. Mm -hmm. And you know what that means. You have a sense of what that means. But these systems, 
don't have that. Yeah. All there is is now. Mm -hmm. And there's everything that came before, and then there's whatever's going to come after. Yeah. And the only difference between before and after is this is certain, that is uncertain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's, it seems to me that it's likely mm -hmm. that these programs and machines in general are never going to cross this boundary mm -hmm. that we so uh, strongly feel. Yeah. Well, maybe I was setting the bar a little bit too high talking about things like consciousness and mm -hmm. feeling pain. Uh, so that's one, you know, projected uh, emergent property. But like you say, uh, it's, it's probably pretty unlikely. But there must be lots of other more modest kinds of emergent things that will happen. Oh, sure. That nobody's really anticipating in terms of, like you said, I mean, maybe they'll come up with a machine will come up with a solution to global warming and, you know, things right. of that sort. Right. And that's uh, something that's actually quite exciting to think about, you know, that, uh, but also some emergent things that we hadn't anticipated that are really bad. And history, the history of technology is littered with, you know, those kinds of carcasses. You know. It's easy to project today some of the problems that these systems are going to cause, mm -hmm. and we've touched on a few. Mm -hmm. The incredible increase in the already ridiculous volume of verbiage yeah. that flows around. Deep fakes, I think, for somebody Deep interested fakes. in politics is going to be pretty disastrous. It's, you know, it, it, there may be a silver lining to this. Now this is, this uh, may get taken to task, pilloried for saying this, but when it gets this bad, Mm -hmm. That you really you don't know if you're talking to a human being, you don't know if that picture is for real. Uh, you know that these systems are out there mm -hmm. studying with mathematical precision what to say to you to persuade you to buy something or to do something, whatever it might be. We may need to erect some new kind of shield. It yeah. may go over the edge and we'll say, you know what, this is just a cesspool of nonsense and we need a way to have a protected area, yeah. you know, it's kind of like the creation of, of uh, countries or cultures, you know, that this is us and that's all the rest of the, the yeah. stuff. And I know, suspect you're going to need AI in order to build that protective shield. I don't doubt it for a second. And they're certainly capable of helping in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the principles that need to be applied are not clear yet, mm -hmm. but I could definitely see that, you know, mm -hmm. is this is this a, a uh, I don't know what the word would be, an approved or a... Uh, a valid mm -hmm. uh, interaction that I'm having, yeah. or that I'm seeing, or that I'm doing, and everything else is just garbage. Well, with deep fakes, I mean, this you get this huge problem with authentication, right? Correct. You don't know whether that photograph was actually taken by a real person at a real event, uh, and so there's got to be some system, you know, that traces the chain of custody of the photograph or something like that. Yes. But it seems to me the only way to solve this is by more technology. I, I think that's true, mm -hmm. but that's a powerful technology can be used against itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you got one system that you know somebody's programming to take over the world. You got another system that's designed <laughs> to prevent it from taking over the world. <laughs> you know, we're going to have to do that. that yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's been uh, political science 101 since uh, I don't know when. Yeah. You know, we we need a, we need we need a strong military so that they don't attack us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not because we want to attack them; it's just to protect ourselves. We're going to clearly do the same thing. Yeah. The real question is, how far does this go? And what are we when this is all done? I think we'll be living in a world where basically the machines will be doing most of what you and I consider the work today. Mm -hmm. And we will be able to live lives that are uh, driven by purpose and meaning <laughs> and our relationships with other people. Yeah. And uh, there'll be other machines trying to prevent that, but uh, it, it's... If we use this wisely, it's going to be an acceleration of the development of humanity, probably unparalleled in the history of humanity. Well, let's hope. I mean, in the early 20th century, a lot of people were projecting that by the time, by by now, we would all be having loads of leisure because right. all that stuff would have happened already. And as far as I can see, people are working harder than ever. So we haven't we haven't gotten there yet. That's true, but. Uh, you, you, you're kind of pointing to, uh, was it Keynes, I think? Yeah. Um, he wrote a very interesting paper saying in, in, in 2010, you know, here's, you only need to work, you know, 20 hours a week, whatever it is. Um, and it's true that that hasn't happened. However, 
the nature of the work that you do yeah. would not have been considered work mm -hmm. probably a hundred years. Well, maybe yeah, in like your business. videos and things like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is why that's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just having fun. Yeah. And if you went back another hundred years, people who spent Work used to mean growing and producing food. Mm -hmm. That's what work was. Mm -hmm. There were some other things, but most, you know, the vast majority yeah. of the human race was involved in the struggle to feed itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say, well, someday we won't have to work back then, they'd look at us and they'd say, you're absolutely not working. I don't know what it is you're doing, <laughs> but you can just go yeah, get it. Yeah, you know, you can right. work an hour a week. Yeah. Go, you know, go uh, get a jug of wine, mm -hmm. dig a hole out in the woods, and mm -hmm. you know, build a shack, yeah. and and you could live a fabulous life. Right, you know? right. And uh, the you the reason that we're still working so hard is we seem to have an instinct for, to increase our standard of living. Yeah. And if it weren't for that, like, I mean, people want to work. They want to feel. They want to feel purpose. Yeah. yeah. It gives your life meaning. It gives it purpose, and uh, this will expand the opportunities to do that. Okay. Well, this whole video. Uh, has actually not occurred. It's all been created by an AI. So <laughs> this is not actually Jerry Kaplan. Uh, this is an avatar that's been produced uh, by a generative AI program. I'm not really Frank Fukuyama either. Uh, so this is a pretty impressive demonstration of what AI can do. But Jerry, thank you uh, for talking. Um, we'll look forward to the book uh, when it comes out. Uh, but we're, you know, we're, we're going to have to have multiple iterations of this conversation because. Sure. This is one of those things, you know, like every six months, this, uh, the world is going to look a lot different and, and it's going to be hard to keep up with it. Uh, yes, it's moving very quick. It was very difficult to write the book mm -hmm. because from the time I started till the time I turned it into the publisher, things had changed quite a bit. Yeah. Can I plug the book for it? Please. Okay. Uh, the title is uh, Generative Artificial Intelligence, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's part of a series of books, of What Everyone Needs to Know series from Oxford University Press. And hopefully, someday, somebody watching this will go, oh, maybe I can buy that. And yes, well, we will, we'll, we'll talk again when the book is actually out and, okay. and uh, people can buy it. Great. Okay, Thank thanks very friend. much.